Today I'm going to take a bit of break from the book of Acts because uh, coming the, this, having this um, uh, kind of uh, influence conference coming next week. And I will just take this October, month of October as a, like a marriage month or relationship month. And I'll just really focus on that in uh, the department because it's so important issue. By the way, do you know that October is actually appreciating pastors month? You didn't know that. I didn't know that either. No wonder you are not appreciating me. This, so now you know. I'll wait on you. I will say how you can appreciate me. Okay, good. Um, so I just want to take a break from um the book of Acts just this week and next week we're gonna have a pastor Samson coming up. And the today's topics is on as the day drawing near. It's from the Hebrew chapter ten. The reason I want to talk about this is because um, the issues that I've been facing personally and as a church and the people around me, it's not necessarily because they are not good Christian or they are not um, um, immature Christian. And I'm seeing this again and again that the people are like in Christ, they have a relationship with God and they sometimes they know in their head, they experience a lot. But the gap between what they know and how they live. This is where the discipleship issue occur. What you know, the gap between what you know and how you live. And um, so easily for a pastor to think that if I teach people well and if they know enough, and they'll be able to live out what they know. And that is not the case, isn't it? Yeah. And over and again, again, then I'm surprised over the people's life when I see that they know it, they heard it, and they don't get to live out the full expand of the uh, uh, the experience of the Christian life. It's not just someone else's life. Actually, sometimes I see my life, you know, that I know who God is. I know what God has done through Christ, and this amazing news of gospel is good news of, of gospel. How much is influencing my life, my relationship with my wife? My work, my journey, yeah. So today, I just want to just uh, share with you that today, the, from the Hebrew chapter ten, it's just a really short passage, and uh, it's going to be short sermon. Try to keep the promise, right? But um, people in Melbourne and Gold Coast and everywhere, I want you to really, really just focus on this one passage together and see what the Bible says. How should we live out this journey after you become a Christian? And what are the key points that we should constantly remind ourselves to maintain that our relationship with God, that exciting and make this our relationship real and really profound and deep, yeah? See, I don't want you guys to be just surviving Christian. These days, a lot of people telling me and encouraging me, hey, Pastor Joshua, we just have to turn up. You know, someone said that you know, most of the 50% of life Achievement can achieve through turning up, you know, show up. You know, actually, there's an element of truth in there. You now, you may not have to do something great, but just faithfully showing up, turning up, and resilient, and just being faithful, and you know, going in one direction sometimes get you where you know where you need to be. Yeah, if you're constantly dropping out, constantly you know, going ups and downs, you know, through the motion, if you have this pattern, always quitting. In the hardest time, and there's a reason why you are not getting to the destiny that God has in mind for you. Yeah, sometimes showing up is all you need to do, and do that. Yeah, and especially the people who just had a baby. You know, baby just need to grow up and get fed, and the day will come. You know, I can tell you that. You know, Nathan grow up in eleven. Just give your baby eleven years. Give yourself eleven years. <laughs> Survive eleven years. And they go to school by themselves, right? And they feed for themselves. That's good. That's good news? No? <laughs> yeah. But survival is important. I think so, right? But I don't think we should aim to just survive. I think we should aim to thrive. Amen. And that's what we are called to do. And what's the key to live, and survive, and thrive in this world as a Christian? Let's read chapter, uh, Hebrew chapter 10, 19 to 25. Let me read to you. Therefore, brothers, 
since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. And since we have great priests over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from on evil conscience, and our bodies washed with the poor, pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Amen. Can I just have a short prayer? Holy Spirit, when I read this passage, you have spoken into our heart, into my heart. You gave me some principles, some guidelines on how I should live out this journey, especially these days. So Lord God, with the same inspiration, with the same message, I pray that you would you speak to the people who are hearing the word today, this morning, wherever they are, Lord God, wherever they come from, whether they are in Melbourne, in the home or Gold Coast, or they are here right now, sitting here, and um, whether they come from the exciting, the new season of their life, or they're coming from the dry and the barren and the season of the suffering, Lord God, I pray, Lord God, all of us may hear the same message and be encouraged, be revived by your power, by your strength, Lord. Teach us how to hear from you, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, let's have a just quick Bible study here. You know, whenever you read, whenever you read the, um, the therefore in the Bible, you know, what do you do? What do you do normally? You should really understand this therefore is the um, kind of connecting word. And you have to understand what actually happened before and the, read the Bible in the context. Yeah, it's a, it, 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 this passage starts with word therefore. Therefore, basically now, if I give you a quick context of therefore, is uh, uh, throughout all this time, the, the, the author of the Hebrew, we don't really know who the author of Hebrews are, is, but he's been talking about the excellency of Jesus. How this Jesus is excellent, superior to everything that you know of. He is a perfect. Perfect in what way? Perfect sacrifice. And he's also a perfect priest. This has been illustrating one thing after another, how Jesus is excellent. Now, as you know his excellency, therefore. That's how it starts. Therefore, brothers. So if you know this Jesus, who Jesus is, what he's done, brother, since we have a confidence to enter, to enter, uh, to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. So what just happened before is they talked about the sacrifice and the sacrificial system. Are you aware of what sacrificial system is? It is basically a system that God endorsed to allow people to find a way to be forgiven by God. We are simply, uh, because of our sin, we are separated from God. And uh, we are under the punish punishment. You know, we are destined to die eternally. And God did not leave us that state um, in His grace and in mercy. He gave us the system that where that we actually bring an animal and kill it and see the show the blood and we are pardoned. The problem with that is that it's only temporary, it's imperfect. So people had to constantly come up with a new sacrifice, new giving, um, new animals, and because we constantly find our new sin. And to replace that, there's a big gap. Between, the reason it's so temporal, so imperfect, is because still there's a big gap between God and man. God cannot be approached. God cannot be perceived. God cannot be touched. God cannot be comprehended. God cannot be related. God is too holy, too far away from the sinful people. Yeah? Sometimes we feel that way too, don't we? Yeah? But because of Jesus, what happened through Jesus is since we have a confidence to enter the holy places, holy places in the Bible 
is a place where God dwells. Well, holy of holies in the temple. And that's the place that you are not allowed to go in. Only the perfect person, I mean the priest, the most clean person can go in and uh, intercede or uh, like uh, mediate before the people, right? And they talk to God and God talk to the person because God is that holy. But what he's saying is that before it was only a temporal imperfect priest can go in and there's still the division between God and man. But now we have confidence to enter the holy place. Now even we can go in. Even if we are not as holy as the priest, we are not as clean as them. Why? Because by the blood of Jesus. Because of perfect sacrifice. And this sacrifice by the new and living way he opened for us through the curtain. This is an interesting illustration. Do you remember the how when Jesus died, the curtain was ripped apart and the is on Luke and all the synoptic gospel says that when Jesus died on the cross, there's a curtain in the Holy of Holies that covers the, this, uh, uh, the most holy place uh, to, to block the access from the people to go in got ripped apart, you know, torn apart, symbolizing now the door is open. Now, the for the first time, humanity can enter into the presence of God. That's what it means. How it happened, the, how the door opened is through the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's a new way because it's never done before. It was till now, never any man can actually relate with God, have a relationship with God like this. There is an intimate, real, and perfect relationship is open for us. It's new, new relationship. And it's also living. It's not a, Jesus is not just a martyr who died on the cross for the good cause. No, he is a resurrected being. In his living way, you know, if you see the way, this is typical, uh, the, the, the description of Jesus is, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the resurrection. He, he described, I'm the only way that you can come to God. Yeah. And it's not just a way, but it's a living way. It's a way that actually constantly draw us near. You know, it's living in our every day of our lives. How did it happen? Through his flesh. Basically means through his sacrifice. Yeah? All right. That's what happened. And since we have a great priest over the household, the house of God. So we talk about sacrifice here, sacrifice here. But now we talk about priest here. We have a perfect priest, perfect sacrifice. You got that? Now, this is a basic summary of what's happening talking about the therefore part. And so now you know all this. Now, if you have that knowledge and that truth, if you really believe in this in your heart, this is what you should do. This is what I need you to uh, do in your life. This is where your head actually meets your heart. This is where what you know meets what you do in your life. Got that? This is exciting part. I love this part. Verse 22, it says, let us draw near. You know what? I'm going to give you a bit of a summary because verse 22 to 25, there are three, uh, like, uh, the sequence of starting with uh, let us and these three principle. If you believe in uh, Jesus, what Jesus has done for your life and this what needs to happen in your life. First is uh, let us draw near. Second, let us hold fast. Third, let us consider. Let us draw near, hold fast, and consider. I want you to actually remember this. Okay? I know most of people don't remember the sermon, yeah? Except my sermon. Well, thank you for laughing at that, right? <laughs> Otherwise, it would be very awkward. I know, you know, I re realized that I shouldn't trust you guys, you know, because people don't really remember the sermon. Always people remember my joke or the story that I tell. And absolutely out of context sometimes. I preach in the Perth and I talk about the, my life story and all this stuff. I'm not quite sure how much and how many people actually got the real point, but they were laughing and crying and all that stuff. But are they crying because of my story or because of the story of Jesus, right? Because of that, I really want to help you to, before you go home, remember this. Please repeat after me. Draw near. Hold fast. Consider. Let's do it again. Draw near, 
hold fast. Consider. Amen. This is what the Bible wants us to do. And this is so funny. I mean, sorry, it's a side note. Why I say, ask you to repeat after me. I sound so Korean, Korean and you just repeat after me with a perfect Australian accent. So it's quite interesting to hear that. First point, draw near. But before I talk about that, you know how it talks about let us, let us. Don't you think it's, it's quite astonishing? It didn't just command this part. I know a lot of command in the Bible, in the New Testament, but this part, it says, let us. Author include himself. I, I'm, I need to do this. So let us do it together. Let us. Let's do it together. Yeah? There's certain encouragement, certain commandment come with this. I'm part of it too. I'm actually, the, the heart of my sermon today is actually that. I'm not saying you should do it because I've been doing it or you should follow me. It's actually something that I'm struggling with as well. Now, I'll be completely honest with you. This passage helped me and hopefully help you because we need to do it together. Let us do it together. If you know what Jesus has done on the cross, that gospel message, that simple, powerful work of God, the finished work of Jesus. If you know that, let us, let us live out a certain way. Number one, let us draw near. Let us draw near. Draw near to who? Obviously, it implied to draw near to God. Why do we need to draw near to God? This is a theological question. Are we already in God? Are we already theologically in Christ? Is there more like a distance to cover for us to get closer to God? See, that is actually a very interesting point that you need to think about. Just when you're being saved, that you enter into the realm of a light, you from the realm of darkness. You were the enemy of God, now you're children of God. So you become newborn. You are born again Christian. But you should never stop there because that is not the end. That is the beginning. Bible constantly say that, oh, you became a Christian. Put your trust in Christ and let the journey begin. Do not stop there and it says, walk in a manner that worthy of his calling. Ephesians chapter 4. What it means is that you have to have a certain way of walking and in Hebrew, it says, you know, you have no certain way of drawing, constantly desiring, getting closer to what? To God. See, because of Jesus Christ, the door is open. He opened it for us. Door is open, but some people don't enter into the door. It's accessible, but not many people make an access to it sometimes. Yeah? But we, probably Christian, enter into it, but you still staying in the doorstep. You don't know that you are actually inviting you to coming closer. And there is a distance to cover. And there is a much greater joy, much greater power, much greater life that you can live in Christ. This is not it. Yeah, that's what it's saying. Draw near. Come close to God. You can get closer to God. Amen? And this is something that I'm learning this day more and more. I thought I know enough sometimes. I thought, you know, we have an attitude sometimes. I've seen it. I heard it, you know. You know some of you come to church. Uh, Pastor Joshua again. Mm, I heard his sermon before, right? You know, you, you have no expectance in your heart. And then you don't really, you know, you know just ready to receive something from God because of any pastor preaching all that stuff. Okay, I, I, I really want to encourage you. No. Even if the same preacher, you know, with the same sermons, and there is still something that God can do in your life. Hmm. Only sure I saying amen to that. Amen. So what we need to do is to draw near. Let's get closer to God. And how do you do it? How do you draw near to God? That, that's a question you should ask in your mind straight away. Yeah? How? This is how you should. With a true heart, number one, with a true heart. True heart, the true means sincerity. It's a real heart, the sincere heart. 
The heart matter is actually drawing near to God. It's not going to some place. It's not a location issue. It's a heart issue. The greatest issue in our life actually happens in the heart. Relationship, marriage, friendship, every day of your life is actually heart matter. Do you agree? Isn't it? Now, most of the uh, the issue that I have probably with my wife is that I didn't really read her heart and she didn't receive my heart. We didn't meet heart to heart. We didn't know how to talk and communicate heart to heart. We just live together, sleep together, have a baby together. And we just work together, you know, pay mortgage together. And then you do that for over years. You feel like, that. who are you? I feel so away, distance from you because the drawing near never happened to each other. Because it's a hot matter. God wants you to come to Him with a true heart. Not hypocritical heart. That's opposite of all that. That's what Jesus, when He came, the first thing He challenged is the people who thought they know God. The people who thought they are close to God. And God, Jesus challenged them, Hey, you have, your heart is like, like rotten. But you're like a very well covered tomb. Outside you look good, but inside is rotten. And he always says, you hypocrites. Isn't it? That's the opposite of the true heart. In full assurance, secondly, of faith. When you have a faith in Christ and it invites you into this world of assurance. Hey, trust in me. Have faith in me. I got your life. Okay, this is where, okay, a, a bit Calvinistic theology here. I mean, some of you guys enjoy a bit more, right? And we believe in the assurance of salvation. Our salvation is not up to me. Salvation is not like we have to work it out. And that's the beginning. And also that's end as well. We are saved by grace and live by grace as well. And we always say, so you want to Christian and forever Christian. I know other, uh, the Baptist party is a bit disagreeing because not necessarily they are wrong because they're seeing a bit different angle because there are some people in the Bible fall away from the faith. And what we are saying is that then that faith was not real faith anyway from the very beginning. And what we're saying is that when you put your trust in God from the genuine heart, from then on, God holds you. It's like a father will never abandon their, his child. If the child can walk away, father always wait. Prodigal son, right there. So, my friend, have some assurance in your heart. No matter what kind of wave is blowing your way in your life, even if you fail God, even if you make mistake, have an assurance in your heart of faith. And that's how you draw near to God. And also, with our heart sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. Oh, this is a good part. And then the, your heart is cleaned, right? And uh, from an evil conscience. This evil conscience is the, the, the enemy attacks in the place called conscience. The inner being. They attack the very core of a man and they temper with it. They actually challenge that. And the idea is that because enemy challenges the conscience part and we always wrestle with it, struggle with it, and make sure, make sure that you have nothing to hide from God when you come closer to God. And there's a reason, one reason, you probably never make a, like a, you gain the distance. You always remain same distance because you do not know how to clean, have a clean conscience before the Lord. Yeah? You always examine, you always check your heart before the Lord and what you've done, what you say, how you relate with others and there's a cleanness in you. Now, but, okay, listen carefully. It does not mean you can only come to God when you are perfect. No. It's like my brother and my, my best friend, he was smoking in Korean church, one of the greatest sins that take you straight to hell is smoking. Right, <laughs> you know that's how I grew up, and he was smoking when he was in the high school, like year eight. I, if I think about it, oh my goodness, that's why this guy's age. He was start smoking that. One day, the pastor came to him, says he was so angry because you can smell. If you don't smoke, I can smell anybody who smoke. Right, so yeah, careful, you know. And and the pastor go up to him, says he actually I saw him saying that to him. I said, hey, 
if you want to come to church, quit the smoke, I mean, quit the smoking first, then come to church. He said that. So my friend quit it. Really? He quit the church. <laughs> and, I was, and actually, that really scarred me. It's like, really? Even the young mind, as a young Christian reading the Bible, I'm not quite sure that statement, if you want to come to God, quit your smoking. Is that valid? Is that biblical? I just didn't get that. I even couldn't understand where they come from. I think, I think what he meant is that you need to really, you know, check your life and you need to really make sure that you don't continue the bad habit. Maybe that is right. You know, he was challenging him, rebuking him. That could be right. But you never, you never deal with, you know, with the, the relationship with God, with the things that you do. Yeah? Perfection is where we are getting to, but it's not the condition that God asks us to get near to him. He says, come to me. Come to me first. If you can't come, if you fail, get up and come back. If you fall and stand up and if you can't come, walk to me, crawl. Do whatever it takes to come near me because I have the answer. You don't have an answer outside of me or far away from me. You want to struggle? Struggle here. If you want to be cleansed, come to me and be cleansed by the power of God. If you want to quit smoking, come to church and struggle with it. Any addiction, any sin, anything that you've done, come near is a command. And in the process, we try to maintain the good conscience because the enemy always attacks our conscience. Yeah? Oh, I have that too. And how many people come to church and you can't even sing and when you sing the song you can't even smile and even before you hear the sermon you already close your heart yeah i'm, I'm looking at some of you yeah you know it's just like oh yeah i don't know oh, no it's not really relevant to me you already close your heart why because you are not really living up the life with christ and your heart is hardened and because the enemy is saying that yeah hey, no i know what you've done last summer I know what you've done last summer. You know, that kind of thing. And the John Piper says actually this, you should know how to silence the conscience because of Jesus Christ. Not because you are, you know, that the self-righteous and the hard-hearted you know, kind of person. No, because you know what Jesus has done in your life. You said, I know what I've done. I know who I am. I know I made a mistake. But, but I know this Jesus, his blood it will come, like it will wash away the, all the sin. I know he has a power, he has a love in my and for, for, for my life. So be silent, your conscience. I come before God. I will draw near to God because that is where the answer is, not the other way around. The religion says, come back when you're perfect. Christianity says, come to God, then he will make you whole. Amen. So first thing you should do, draw near. Oh, do it whatever it takes, guys. If it's singing, sing out loud. If we pray, pray. Come to prayer meeting. Come to church. Call me. Call Mike. Uh, call mostly Mike. You know. <laughs> you know. So if you're just struggling, just make sure that you do something about it. Saying to draw near, make every effort to come near to God. I'm telling all the people that are listening to this. There's no sin, no sin that God cannot deal with. But only thing that God cannot do anything about when you stay away from God. You need to come close to God. I hope our church be that kind of church too, isn't it? Church filled with the sinners. And it sounds very ironic, but that's what it is. I want the church to fill with the sinners because sinners are the ones who are seeking God. This is not the place for the self-righteous place. People who come and hungry and thirsty for God's righteousness and His love upon our lives. And anybody can come to that door. Amen! And also it talks about 
our body washed with pure water, basically baptism. It symbolizes baptism and you're conducting your life in such a way. So draw near with all these elements. Even if you fail, you draw near, but because God will give you strength. So let us draw near true heart. Number two, also, not just coming too close to God, but because there are times, even if you want to come closer to God, the current of the world pushes away, pushes you away, yeah? And made you doubt. And made you unable to come to God or this internal struggle, internal battlefield. Sometimes, don't we? Don't we, yeah? Sometimes it's theological. Sometimes it's your, uh, your uh, behavior or your emotional. But 23 says, not just coming to draw near, but hold fast. Let us hold fast. Hold fast. What? Confession of our hope without wavering. Hold fast our hope. Hope is futuristic. Hope is what is to come. Hope is what you don't see. But hope is what you know in your heart. And when you know what it's going to be tomorrow like, you stay alive today. When you see what is coming into your life, that hope is there. You hold fast that hope. No matter muddy and dark in our life that you have today, you push on. You hold fast. I think this is the place where I really want to talk about Christian grit. You know, this grit. Sometimes, you know, you just have to just stay there. You have to just stay against the current, right? You may not be able to have a, you know, like an exciting, you know, joyful, you know, the things that are happening around you, but you don't drop the ball. You don't give up. You don't throw the towers. Like, I'm going to hold fast because I know this God has my life. This God has planned for me. The hope is in front of me. Why do we have hope? Not because we are able, not because we are smart, not because we are right. Why? Because for he who promised is faithful. Because he is faithful. Our hope is utterly upon who God is. That's why you can hold fast. Because it's not up to you. If it's up to you, be worried, right? Be concerned. Because I know we are not that strong, isn't it? No matter how smart you are. I've seen so many people. I don't know which one was that. Um, I had a short conversation with one of the pastors. He was saying his father was so like a really proud man because he's very well, well, like a rich and he's very smart and he's always saying that things like, and I can control my life. And he always buys something and always like a, the price jump up and he always really invests well and then and he thought he's actually invincible. He's like God. And he hated him for that. But he started to see how he's starting to reduce because what he invested didn't go as well as he used to. You know, he didn't really calculate wrong. And you know, he's the wealth going down and running down. And he see himself, he see his father being humble, being humble and humble. And no man, no man is able to hold fast if it's all up to them. Today, the Bible tells us, hey, if Jesus is your Lord and Savior, hold fast. In the difficult time, in the hard time, hold fast. Why? Not because of you, but because He's faithful. Know who He is. He's done that in the Bible. That's why I go back to the Bible. See this, how these people, they're not that great people. David, Abraham, you know, they're all... Messed up people sometimes, you know. And it's like, well, if God can use me, he can use me. You know, sometimes I think that too. No, forgive me. But that, that's what it was. We never elevate people's status because it's not about man. The Bible is a story of God, not a story of a man. And saying, by God, God is saying, I am faithful. I am faithful. I am faithful. Just like I am faithful to Abraham, I'll be faithful to you. Just like I'm faithful to Daniel, I'll be faithful to you. Just like I'm faithful to David, I'm faithful to you. And remember who I am. So hold fast today. Don't give up. Confession of our hope without wavering. I love it about this part of confession of our hope. Um, 
Ever since I started this church, I really wanted to church that less Asian. <laughs> I've totally talked about this because, not necessarily because you know, I'm a, like a, a extrovert and I want to make church loud. You know, not actually. That is something about church know how to declare. No, I really believe in that. On Sunday morning, you guys come. You know, I don't know what kind of church you expected. Right? We don't play hymns. We don't play like everybody like wearing like a solemn and they're really like holy and all that. You know, we don't do that, right? What we do, I'm mean, coming up here and let's, let's pray for each other. Let's say we declare the truth. Why? It's because when you confess that something occurs in your life, in your heart. I have seen that too. So I did a wedding last night, yesterday. You know, we don't say it in the weddings, like it's in the most critical time of their life. We don't say that, okay, you know, now and I'm confess each other that you love each other silently. Just mean it, not each other. We don't do that, isn't it? Say it out loud. Make sure that you say, I do, right? Make sure that I love you. You repeat after me and yesterday. And I made him to do repeat after him twice because he was too quiet. I made him kiss twice because he just kissed right him. And what's going on, man? You're just married. Do it again. <laughs> Sometimes public decoration before the Lord because we are so pressed upon the world and enemy too many times. We're hearing all sorts of noise from the world. You are not good enough. You are not going to be successful. You are not going to be victorious. You are failed. You are sinful. You always mistake. You are misunderstood God. You always disappoint God. All those mind, all those voices you have, you come to church and you say, shut up. You said, I have hope in Christ. You say it out loud. And you know what happens when you do that? When one person say it out loud and say, Jesus, you are my shield and my strength. And someone sitting next to hear it. Someone next to hear it is like, oh, what the going on? <laughs> and saying, oh, wow. And as they hear it, it affirms in their heart. And it's like, okay. And I believe in that too. Jesus is my strength. Jesus is my strength. Jesus is my strength. And that actually becomes domino effect. Ripple effect in church becomes a church that knows how to declare the truth and the enemy will run away in Jesus' name. Really? Do you know the enemy actually listening what I'm preaching, how you worship? That's a spiritual understanding. Satan loves you, internalize everything, not knowing how to confess and declare. It's a confession of hope that I believe in this God because He is faithful. You say that, confess it from your heart, out of your mouth, to each other. Through that, let us hold fast. But lastly, I just finish here, but this is very important for me. Let us consider. What are we considering? What are we considering? Consider how to stir up one another. Ah, the word stir up here is stimulate. How to stir Stimulate each other. See, it's not about how to stimulate yourself. Let, let us consider ourselves. A lot of times we just consider ourselves, isn't it? Yeah? We come to church and we talk about my problem, my issue. And I know this is the most relevant thing that you can do, you know. But Bible says, no, no, don't just do that. You have to learn how to consider each other, one another, how to stir up. Now, what you consider defines who you are. I know it's an overstatement. It's, it is an overstatement, but there's an element to truth in there. Think about that. What you consider defines who you are. Why don't you examine what do you always think about? What are you considering in you? Now, when you're alone, that occupies that your mind. It actually what shapes you. And what we do need to do is biblical truth is that do not let the thought governs you. Do not let the thought drives you. You drive the thought. You govern the thought. You choose to consider. You know, a lot of Christians come together in the name of doing godly thing and they end up gossiping. Yeah. Life group, prayer meeting. Oh, let's share a prayer point. You know, we just share a prayer point around. And you end up, oh, I'm just want to pray for, I love this brother, but he is so terrible. You know, just talk about how he is. Just, you know, I, I want God to change him. You know, just in a way that you are actually gossiping the person and the bad-mouthing person. 
bad mouthing the church, bad mouthing the leadership, bad mouthing your par- parents, bad mouthing your the your husband and wives. You know, you are considering the wrong thing, my friend. What you need to consider is to consider how to stir up one another, to do what to love. Oh oh. Oh oh. To love. Oh, new page. To love and good works. Hey, can I just ask an honest question? I'm just really curious about this too. When was the last time? You don't have to answer that to me, but I just want to ask a question. When was the last time when you get together as a Christian, whether you did church or outside of church, when was the last time you really wrestle with the idea, how can I love someone more? How can I help someone to love, help someone to do good work? When was the last time those kind of thought was occupied and you considered? I know some of you guys are very theologically minded. I'm not, I'm not counting some of you guys here. There's nothing wrong with that because I'm, I'm like that too. But before we talk about Calvinism or Arminianism or predestination or secessionism and all the stuff, when was the last time you sit down and talk to people and, hey, let's talk about how can we love each other? I know it sounds corny, no? But is there anything that we can actually help each other, encourage each other, stir up, stimulate each other? How can I stim- stimulate you to love and to do good work? I- I'm really, really curious because I want to do that too. I want to meet people like you on the dinner, over the dinner table and just have fun together. You know, I don't want to be serious all the time, you know, but I just have a fun with you guys. And uh, during the time, it's like, hey, but, you know, let's, let's think about it. Is there a way that we can actually make church a bit more exciting place? Is there a way that we can make people, the newcomers can be welcome? Is there a way to help people to really love on God more? Is there a way that people actually feel loved in our church? What can we do without blaming someone, you know, what's not happening, what's going on in the church and all that stuff? You know, I just thought, have a question because what Bible says is that you need to choose what to consider how to stir up one another love to love and good work let's just think about stirring up you now how do we stir up there's a certain intentionality in this meaning you sitting there you shouldn't be passive on each other you are actually responsible for someone sitting next to you that's what the church is about. Amen? I really want to see the people who stand up. And that is what uh, maturity is all about. My kid go, don't go out and say hello to the newcomers or new faces or that. And actually, mature Christian ask God, God, is there anybody that you want me to pray for in the church? And you walk around and try to stir up someone to love and good work. One of the things I do is this, I help you to, as a pastor, to not neglect to meet together. That's one of the, my job to stir up. We need to learn how to not neglect meeting together. You probably have a, some of you probably have a misunderstanding when I push the idea of a house church. You know, I probably downplayed on Sunday church. And please, but don't take me wrong. I really believe in Sunday church is important. Yeah? And especially, when church is doing the things like next week, come on guys, let's get together because the marriage matters. Relationship matter. And can we as a church come together and really consider this thing together? Let's fight this battle together because it's our fight. It's my fight right now. It's your future fight. And slow or later, your children's fight is going to be real for all of us. This is going to shake all of us. This is going to damage us. This is going to you know, and expand us. This is going to make our life a completely different live a life. All together. So let's deal with this. When we say things like, I want church to respond. I want church to really, oh, okay, let's get together. Let's do something about this. Let's consider to stir up each other. Because alone, I am always weaker. When we are together, I am stronger. I know that. So I need you. You need me. That attitude is what Bible is saying. Yeah? So I'm asking you next week to come. Saturday afternoon, Saturday night, and Sunday morning, Sunday. I know sometimes it's a big deal. I'm doing it every week, right? Well, I'm not doing this because I'm paid by 
you guys, but it's, it's more than that. Right? Because there's, a, there's God, the way God set it up. So I don't expect you to do that every week, but just once a week, once a year, how about we get together and really try to consider each other? And I know God's going to bless us. Not necessarily just through Pastor Sam, so he's a great speaker, but just because you got together. Not neglecting meeting together is God's idea. Because it easily becomes habit of some. I don't know how that happened. It easily becomes habit of some people. And when do you do it? Why do you do it? It says, all the more as you see the day drawing near. Today's sermon is all about the day is coming near. I see the world right now. <laughs> it's a ple- plebiscite uh, ple- 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 of homosexual marriage and all that. You know what? I just want to make it very clear that we are not hating homosexual people. We are not homophobic because we don't have a fear of a homosexuality. We love people. Okay? But we have an issue and concern about the, the lifestyle they have. So we will address that biblically. But we welcome the sinners wherever you are. But this is a sign the day is drawing near. And your life, the world, the where we are, is going to be ending very soon, one way or another. On Saturday, last day, the, um, one of the girls came to me and asked me, what do you mean by the day? What day is drawing near? And I say, the day either you die or Jesus comes back is drawing near. So what do you do? Well, are you a Christian? Yes, I'm a Christian. Then do the three things. Draw near. Hold fast. And consider. There's something that you need to do together. And you have to decide by yourself, I will do this. I will consider it. And I'm praying, praying, praying hard to God. Let this church be the church who really allow this culture to rise up. Hey guys, as a church, we are facing our own challenge right now. I struggled. Absolutely honestly, I struggled. A few months was the hardest time of my life. I know some of us are going through even harder time, I know. I just the fact that I can't help the people around me is that devastates me too. I feel like I'm a failure. You know, there are decisions that I have to go through that feel like that I just not helping. Or maybe I'm not a right pastor for the church. But God is speaking to me one day after another, encouraging me and saying that no, you have to understand that what the world is like and that what kind of church you need to be now. Welcome to the real world and you need to become real church. We are not going to just play church anymore and we will see the hurts and pains and struggles of the people who have never seen it before. And you will see how far the love of God will go. You will see how amazing and powerful and real His love is for us. So if you know that, draw near, hold fast and consider and to start to stir up the people to each other. Take a responsibility for each other to stir up each other. And one thing I really love enjoying seeing in our life group is the one girl, you know, she's not here, and you know, she is a master of bugging people. Whenever she doesn't see anyone doesn't turn up on life group, she texts them to death, right? Why aren't you here? Why aren't you here? Why aren't you here? When are you coming? When are you coming? Why aren't you here? Are you coming next week? Are you coming? She actually, apparently, she actually threatening the person. They come to life group because they're scared of her, right? I don't know exactly the method, but we all know the heart behind it. She decided to consider how to store up each other. That's how we become a church. Sorry, just being a bit emotional here. But there are people in Melbourne, people in Gold Coast, and people in this room. I want you to really pray to God to give us this church, that heart, that vision. And we'll see one day one day, not because we are mega church, not because we are, you know, have our own building, but the church 
is built upon this truth. We'll be the church reaching out to the lost and the last and the least. In Jesus' name, let's pray.